Go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Carlton Fong. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at Texas State University. And this webinar, uh, I'm the chair of the webinar committee for APA Division 15. And I want to introduce um, my co-chair for this session, Can. You can go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Can Gill. Uh, I am a graduate student member of the webinar committee. I'm a second year doctoral student uh, at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, happy to be here and great to see you all. So um, a little introduction for this event today. Um, we, the APA Division 15 webinar committee, we gather together. Uh, this was maybe last summer and we brainstormed ideas and this topic of um, educational psychology and politics and education related le legislation and policies really emerged as one of the most critical issues that we're facing our field, um, especially amid the culture and identity wars we find ourselves in. And so we really saw the desperate need to continue um, thinking about these issues. Uh, we actually reached out to Francesca Lopez, uh, who gave a webinar two years ago on a similar topic, and we really saw the desperate need to really um, engage um, in this critical discussion. So we emailed her, and um, like Francesca does, she responded in 10 seconds, and she said, we need to get Dr. Sleater and Dr. Kumar Shiro talking to our division and talking to um, our partners in the field. And so... Um, they gladly agreed. So we're so happy that they're here. So we wanted to go ahead and um, introduce our presenters. And so we'll start with um, Dr. Kumashiro and Cam's going to introduce him. Oops, I think you're on mute still, Cam. Sorry. Thanks for letting me know. Zoom always gets me like that. Uh, all right. Uh, Dr. Kevin Kumashiro is an internationally recognized expert on educational policy, school reform, teacher preparation, and educational equity and social justice, with a wide-ranging list of accomplishments and awards as a scholar, educator, leader, and advocate. He has led multiple equity-focused initiatives and centers, including the founding of the Center of Anti-Oppressive Education. He is currently interim dean of the School of Education at Hofstra uh, University. And we also have um, Dr. Christine Sleater. She is an education activist and professor emerita in the College of Education, California State University, Monterey Bay. She has helped hundreds of teachers become better teachers of their school's culturally diverse students. Her work primarily focuses on multicultural education, preparation of teachers for culturally diverse students and schools and anti-racism. She has served in multiple leadership roles in and received numerous accolades from ARA and the National Association for Multicultural Education. She is also a member of the National Academy of Education. We are so delighted to have them here, so grateful to learn from them and engage with them and get to hear their insights. And so without further ado, we will start with our first question. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, kick things off by asking this question. Uh, so our first question is, uh, considering our country's political landscape uh, and recent developments in education-related legislation, uh, how would you name the current moment? Um, and what are some of the pivotal moments in the past uh, that might have led us here? Um, let's go ahead and start with Dr. Sleater, uh, followed by Dr. Kumashiro. Thank you, Kim, for the question. And I want to thank the organizing committee for putting together this webinar and for inviting me to participate in it. I think this is really exciting. Um, for me, the current political climate was created to whip up and expand and enlarge a largely white conservative traditional voting base in light of the demographic shifts and the success that a diverse coalition has had in putting an African-American man into the White House twice. And the power of that coalition was on vivid display um, a couple of years ago during the protests against police brutality following the murder of George Floyd. So the political question from the right became, how do you draw in white voters 
and conservative leaning voters of color. Uh, how do you pull them away from this diverse voting coalition and draw them towards a Republican coalition and then actually get people out to vote? How do you get people then whipped up? And a problem that that actually the Republicans have been having for a long time anyway has, has been that the, the goal of the upper elite controlling the party, actually controlling both parties, but particularly on the right, is to make money, not to provide for the general welfare. And, and so it's always been a problem of how do you draw in enough so that you have a majority of voters who will vote against their own self-interest when, for example, your policies really kind of sometimes behind closed doors, but sometimes publicly announced are to um, cut, well, cut taxes, but then cut programs like Social Security, cut Medicare. Um, uh, Trump is still talking away with doing away with um, the Affordable Care Act even though a majority of people in the country have been signing up for it. So how do you get people to line up into a block that's going to vote in favor of policies that favor making money and not providing for the general welfare when that means that people are voting against their own self-interest? And as has been done historically in this country, race is being used as a wedge issue. Um, we can see this in what's happened with the, the flurry over critical race theory. And Francesca Lopez and I have written quite a bit about this in our book, Critical Race Theory and Its Critics. Um, but the, uh, just sort of in uh, briefly, Manhattan Institute blogger Chris Rufo specifically chose the phrase critical race theory as an emotional laden phrase to whip people up. And he, he did this by looking into trainings that were being given for city employees, um, first in Seattle where he lives and then elsewhere, and then looking to see what the training materials were and digging through even footnotes to find out what all was being used. And it was in that process that he ran across the term critical race theory. And it was like, aha, this is what I've been looking for. It, that's a scary sounding phrase. It, it sounds anti-American. You can easily make it sound like anti-American, like people are trying to do away with, with America. Um, and he has then since defined like DEI, uh, diversity, equity, initiative, and, and uh, inclusion offices are how critical race theory becomes institutionalized. Once a company or a university has a DEI office or somebody in charge of DEI, from his perspective, the whole focus of what the institution is about shifts away from what its focus was toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I even heard somebody go so far as to argue that the plug on the Boeing aircraft blew out because of DEI, because people were so focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion that they were no longer paying attention to safety. That, that's, uh, but anyway, that's kind of the logic. Um, that critical race theory then is the ideology, um, an anti-American ideology, and social, social emotional learning is how it gets to your kids, because social emotional learning will then soften up the kids so teachers can ram a radical left ideology down their throat. Um, anyway, he was discovered by um, uh, Tucker Carlson and ended up on the Tucker Carlson show, which Trump watches, and that's how he got into the White House. Um, but I think that something similar would be happening without him, because whenever the control and power of the white elite seems threatened, um, attacks are engineered. And this has happened for a long time. Just sort of recently, back in the 1990s, there were big attacks against um, Afrocentrism and multicultural education because of gains that had been made um, during the 1970s and 1980s in making schools more responsive to people of color. There was an article in the um, you might have seen in the Sunday New York Times about a group at, um, working through the Claremont Institute that has orchestrated a lot of the current attacks on DEI. And, it, and they specifically point out that they're building on the work that Chris Rufo did. Um, so, so that's kind of a context of 
of where these attacks are coming from. I, the culture wars specifically focus on education for a couple of reasons. One is that that's a way that you can mobilize adults who have kids in school, tell them something nefarious is happening to their kids and people will show up. And it's appealing to white people. It's not designed to appeal to people of color. It's designed to appeal to white people. And the second, um, um, uh, reason for focusing on education is it becomes a way of trying to control the narrative about who we are as a nation and what issues are or are not valid. So for me, that's the larger framing in which the current attacks are taking place. Over to Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, hard act to follow, Christine Slater. But big thank you to APA Division 15 and Carlton and Ken. Um, what a treat and an honor to be part of this webinar. And I just want to further plug, by the way, Christine Sleater and Francesca Lopez's book, um, Critical Race Theory and its um, critics, because if you really want to understand everything that she just talked about in terms of the kind of the politics behind these attacks, like what's really going on and how it's not actually about critical race theory, um, I highly encourage you all to check out that book. Um, so I'm I'm glad I get to follow Christine because Christine kind of pointed to the specifics around this attack. So I want to kind of tackle the question of you know how do you how do we name the moment by um, maybe sharing three quick thoughts that come to my mind as to why you know what does it mean to name the moment and you know how do I do that and why is why is that important? Um, and the first thing I wanted to say is. Uh, that I think regardless of our profession, regardless of our role in education, it is incumbent upon us. It's necessary that we are constantly, that we should constantly try to uh, name the moment. I, I think this should be in every time the faculty at a school or university gets together, this is what we should be talking about. Every time the collective bargaining unit gets together, this is what we should talk about. Every parent-teacher association meeting, this is what we should be talking about. We have to be making certain that we're we're really naming the context that we find ourselves in as we then try to figure out and strategize how to respond. Because without really deeply understanding the context, our response and our strategy might be actually be um, counterproductive. And here I draw on, I'm all about using the chat, so I'm going to use the chat to post some thoughts. Many of you are familiar with Paula Ferrari's book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Brazilian educator. This book was published and translated and published in English um, in 1970. And he makes many wonderful arguments, but one of the arguments that he makes that I find very compelling is that we shouldn't you know, rush down a path too quickly to solve a problem until we first more deeply understand what that problem is. And he uses the term reading the world, and I'm using the term um, naming the moment. We need to read the world. We need to name the moment that we're in, because if we don't take the time to do so, we might be buying into someone else's story of what the problem is, which means that the solution we come up with might not come any better. And that then points to a second, well, was, I'm sorry, let me just finish that one point. So that point that why it's important to name the moment is because I, I think it then helps us to answer the question, what is the intervention that I wish to be making? Or what is the intervention that we should be making in this moment, right? Um, I'm all about saying that whether you're an educator or you're a scholar or you're an activist or you're a leader, we should always be thinking about the contribution we want to make to our context or to the world. And that the answer of what's the intervention I want to make cannot be answered until we first understand the context. And that then leads to the second point I want to make, which is one of the ways that I try to name this moment is to um, highlight how uh, deceptive, how, how easy it is to be deceived by other people's stories of what's really going on. Right. Um, in other words, it's really difficult, and I would argue um, um, too narrow to try to understand the reforms under the quote so-called reforms or the attacks on education without also understanding the politics behind these attacks, which is exactly what Christine was pointing out. Right. And the, my intervention in a lot of these conversations, in other words, the the approach I try to take as a scholar of education is to look at how different initiatives are framed. What is the messaging that we use to talk about these initiatives? Which by the way, I, clearly I'm a big fan of Christine and Francesca's book because they also talk a lot about like how seductive the framing has been from the right and how counter 
counterproductive leftist frames can be. Like sometimes those on the left are responding, but we're not necessarily putting forward a better frame. We, we actually in some ways are buying into the same problematic underlying stories. So understanding the framing is really important. And I'll just share a couple of quick examples that I think illustrate my point. One is this book by George Lakoff, some of you may be familiar, where he's trying to understand the different campaigning strategies of those from the Republican Party and those from the Democrats. And his argument is that what kind of conservative movements um, Republican Party included um, have been very successful at doing is messaging, is, is framing things in a way that he says taps into underlying values. My larger argument is that um, messaging is very compelling when it's made to sound commonsensical. Like the more you can make something sound like, well, this is just how things always have been and how things always are, the more you're, you're likely to get people to buy into that versus, um, you know, there's a lot of research-based solutions out there that because they don't match, map on to what we think is the common sense, um, that's, when, that's when those solutions are harder to get implemented, right? Um, reforms are harder to get passed when they bump up against common sense, just even if they're backed by research, just like reforms that that are the worst ideas in the world and that research has already proven to be harmful can actually be easy to pass if you can get them to sound more commonsensical. So that then points to some of the other set of resources I'll share on the second topic, which is when it comes to framing, at least in my work in education, um, commonsensical sounding narratives are part of the strategy to get different things to pass, different policy initiatives to pass. And so here are three of the books that I wrote over the last 15 years where I try to tease apart this argument. And then finally, what I would say um, is my third point is that Another way that I try to think about this moment is why education? Like, why is education so under attack? And I want to try to link our analysis of the attacks on education and the way we want to respond to how we under how we answer the question, why education? Um, you know, if we were in, and here I draw on my dear friend Bill Ayers that many of you may be familiar with. I once heard Bill talking um, in a presentation where he was trying to say, you know, if we were in a totalitarian kind of fascist autocratic society, what would you think education might look like? Well, it might look like the elite gets something super awesome that teaches you creativity and leadership and the masses get something kind of under-resourced, dumbed down that teaches you to follow. And then he kind of pauses and he's like, well, doesn't that kind of sound like <laughs> what we have here in the US, like this very kind of disparate educational system that is teaching you different things depending on kind of your level of privilege. So given that, it begs the question, well, if we were creating an education system that is not only in a democratic society, but that is for a democratic society, what would we say that that should look like? And we can have lots of interesting conversations, but the larger question that I think this begs for me is that if education is serving democracy, it's not surprising that education is going to be one of the central points where society struggles and where it's going to come under attack when, say, totalitarianism is either on the rise or on the decline. Um, this is a moment when education's purpose in advancing democracy is absolutely being undermined. Our job should not be to retreat them from the democratic or the democratizing potential of education, which I think is often what we do when we're under attack. Our job is to actually double down on the democratizing potential of education because that's precisely why it's under attack. And I'll turn it back to Carlton and Ken. Thank you so much um, for all those insights. And yeah, just reiterating the point of, yeah, to the importance of really understanding and, and naming the moment. So thank you for helping us frame that. Um, and um, once again, the, the impetus for this event really came out of a group of educational psychologists thinking, you know, how can our research um, be relevant to um, the political landscape and discourse we find ourselves in. And, um, you know, we, I think as a field, um, are growing in our interest and desire to really be publicly engaged. And so one question that we wanted to ask the both of you is what are some research questions or what are some research topics that educational psychologists might consider as we think about addressing the current moment. And so we'll go back to Dr. Kumashiro and then we'll ping pong back to Dr. Sleater. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm I'm scanning the names, by the way, and um, I'm seeing lots of familiar names. So hello, those of you I already know. <laughs> and if I don't already know you, hello as well. All right. So yeah, what are some important research questions for this moment? You know, um, I'll, I'll again offer three because I like to think in sets of threes. So one thought I have is, um, you know, the early attacks uh, like from the 20s, the 2020s, 2021, um, where this all kind of really began to pick up speed. Some of the language we were hearing, some of the rhetoric was, oh, we shouldn't be teaching about race. Why? Because it makes people uncomfortable. We shouldn't be telling you that you're supposed to feel uncomfortable. Uh, we shouldn't do anything that makes people uncomfortable. And then we would hear people saying like, well, isn't this a form of child abuse? Isn't this like professionally irresponsible and so on? So I think my first um, encouragement is that we explore a lot more about the processes of teaching and learning from a psychological perspective. Um, and in, in particular, you know, I, I think a lot of folks, including myself, have been trying to think about how learning, learning is not merely about, like what is learning? Like learning isn't merely acquiring more information. It's not merely adding to what we have. Learning often involves questioning and being a momentarily skeptical, skeptical about, you, about what you previously thought. In other words, learning often depends on you first unlearning something else. And that necessarily so is going to raise all sorts of emotions, including all sorts of tensions around our sense of self, right? Because our identity is often very much implicated in our beliefs. So I think my first thought then is that, you know, really um, elevating even what we already know about the role of identity and emotion and just the psychology of learning and unlearning to speak back against those who want to say, why should we not teach about certain subjects because it makes us uncomfortable? I think many of us would say, no, actually learning only happens through discomfort and resistance. Like we actually have to think about how we ethically do that, not how we try to avoid it, which means we're not actually teaching and learning, right? I think uh, just side side note, by the way, is I, I would also say even when we don't talk about things, there is teaching and learning happening, right? There's tons of folks who for decades have talked about the hidden curriculum, which is often constituted by silence, by gaps, and so on. So I think even when we don't say something, we're teaching and students are learning, and that therefore needs to be grappled with. All right. Second thing I would say is when we think about um, teachers, because I just talked about students, let's also talk about teachers. What is the psychological impact of these attacks, the, the, the chilling effect, the, the, the actual real threats of physical violence at school boards. Like what is the actual impact on not just teachers mental health, but then our capacity to teach in this kind of a context? I mean, I think we need to have much more of that kind of a conversation. And then even more so, what does it mean then for school leaders, for political leaders, for the community at large, to support the, the well-being of teachers and students? How do we rally around what the research tells us is necessary for teachers and leaders and students to thrive in this moment? Um, and then I think a third thing that I would say is what I'm, you know, as I just got through saying, I think a lot of what I'm obsessed by in my own work on in education is, is around messaging. And there's so much, you know, about, there's so much, psychology that's involved in how we communicate, how we sway, how we are, what are we are open to, not so open to, um, what we're able to see and not see. Um, so I, I think that even beyond the classroom, to understand how we move forward on educational reforms, I think we need to really sort of see what does the research already tell us or what's the new research that we need to understand what it means to communicate about policy, to more effectively frame and message, um, all as a way to do movement building. Like I think movement building isn't just about policy strategy, it's about social and psychological strategy as well. Um, and, and so uh, that's what I would be wanting to personally learn more um, in this work. And I'll pass on to Christine. Thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, what My comments actually kind of, in some ways, uh, not exactly duplicate, but um, connect very directly with, with what you were saying. Um, I think um, an area that educational psychologists could be really helpful with is helping us understand how fear is being used to manipulate people. 
um, on, on a whole variety of levels. Um, at the larger political level, when you hear the right now the, the southern border being used as a fear tool, um, at, like, like how is it that people learn to ignore data and not ask questions out of fear, and then simply accept what they're told out of fear. Um, what I see happening with teachers quite a bit is the fear of, of losing their jobs, the fear of possibly breaking the law it will keep people silent and will keep people from doing things in the classroom that maybe would be actually beneficial to the kids they have. But fear is being used um, very strategically to manipulate people um, into um, the agenda that we've been talking about. So I, I'd like to understand that better. And how can we learn to recognize when our emotions are being um, used so that we can, we can better protect ourselves and resist allowing ourselves to be manipulated emotionally? Related to that, um, I would like, uh, I think educational psychologists can really help us understand how our identities can be manipulated for political purposes, and specifically why people join and identify with cults, because that's really kind of what, especially with the MAGA group, that's really what we have going on. Um, folks who study cults draw parallels between the, the behavior of people right now currently and cult behavior. So how do people get drawn into cults? A number of years ago, I remember reading a book called Women of the Klan that looked at the question of why did Southern white women join the Ku Klux Klan given the, the Klan's um, violence and, and its, its, its history of, of murdering people? Why, why would you join that? And what they basically found is that the women saw their their other women neighbors and they saw it as a social group that they could identify with and they were willing to overlook it sort of ignore the the violence that the clan engaged in as a way of being a part of the social group that they identified with and i was like geez what 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 does that say about the our identities and the power of identities to lead us into becoming something that maybe if we thought about it more, we wouldn't be. So how identities are being leveraged right now, and particularly identities around race and religion, um, to have these um, sort of divisive policies that ignore then what, what education research, and as well as practical experience in the classrooms, says is actually really good for kids. Thank you both for sharing. Um, one of the things that I think really um, stood out in some of this conversation was uh, this point about fear. And I guess segueing from this idea of fear, um, I'd like to ask the following question, which is what is our role as scholars and uh, scholar practitioners? Um, and how can we be more publicly engaged um, despite maybe this idea of fear that has surrounded uh, many of the conversations that we've been having um, uh, could we go ahead and start with you, Dr. Sleater? Sure. Um, a couple of related problems is, is one is that the general public tends to dismiss research or doesn't pay attention to research. And two, as researchers, we've been trained to write for other researchers. And this is something that I've tried to grapple with in my own work of how do I learn to speak to a wider audience, which ends up being, in some ways, it's a doable question, but it's harder than you think if you haven't you know, been kind of working with it. So let me take a specific problem. Um, the, the general public, and particularly white folks, don't generally understand how learning interfaces with context, like how learning relates to culture, how learning relates to one's life experiences, how learning relates to the, the relationships you have with your teacher and with other kids in the classroom. And I've gotten into arguments with about this like over the years, um, often with people who, with white people who will say, well, here's... I didn't, it didn't matter to me if my teacher liked me or believed in me. I just ignored that. Or it didn't matter to me if the curriculum I could relate to it or not. And, and we'll sort of try to universalize from their own experience. Um, and actually, in some ways, psychology has a long history of ignoring the context of learning and just focusing on what happens internally. Um, 
so a problem in, in, in making um, classroom spaces where kids of color thrive means changing things that white folks take for granted, changing who teaches so it's not a predominantly white teaching force, changing how learning occurs in the classroom so it may be more collaborative rather than individualistic, depending on who you have there, changing what's in the curriculum and whose voices predominate in the curriculum. Um, and 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 the whole question about um, should you discuss race in the classroom um, because it makes white kids feel uncomfortable. Well, who does it make uncomfortable if you don't discuss race in the classroom? So assumptions that people have around learning are, are kind of shaped by and partly by, by their own backgrounds. So to write and speak for public audiences, um, there are things that we can do. And then I kind of want to move to messaging because I, I, what Kevin's been talking about messaging, I totally agree with. I think for all of us, learning how to do op-eds and write letters to the editor is really important. Um, Kevin is actually great at teaching people how to write op-eds and he's given me feedback on a couple of them that I've worked on. But this does get a perspective out to the public that otherwise isn't there. Um, finding podcasts and webinars that we can be a part of that speak to a general audience. Um, we need to be doing that. Writing for the popular press. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know if psychology today is still something in the popular press. That, but, but finding things that you know everyday people read and then write for it. Um, it may not help you towards tenure, but it, it is what we need to be doing. And actually, increasingly for various awards and stuff, I'm seeing on people's vitas where they are developing public scholarship. And and many of us now who are looking at this um, applaud that. But also frame messages in a way that both names diversity, names who the perpetrators of problems are, and and draws in every listener. And let me give you an example. Um, this was from um, our book, Critical Race Theory and Its Critics. And I think it might have been words that win that wrote this. Um, Francesca and I didn't make this up, but it's a real good example of framing. No matter our differences, most families, whether white, black, or brown, want the best educational opportunities for their children. But today, some politicians and greedy lobbyists defund our schools and divide us against each other and then point the blame at teachers, black and brown people, and new immigrants. We need to join together with people from all walks of life to fight for our future. By joining together, we can make sure every child receives an education that honors their racial and ethnic background, creating opportunities to thrive. Now, what this framing has done, it specifically named our diversity, rather than saying we can't talk about our diversity because that's divisive. It's specifically naming us so that people from various backgrounds can see themselves in what's being said here. Um, but then rather than blaming groups of people, like rather than blaming immigrants or blaming low income people or blaming parents, it's, it's blaming the policymakers for policies that are working against what all of us want. And all of us want many of the same things, even though we come from different walks of life. So then it, it ends by urging us to then join together across our differences and working collectively politically for the things that will will help all of us thrive and help all of our children thrive. And, and this is a way of, I think, getting a message out and framing a message that um, can be useful to draw people in and help people um, help, help sort of name what it is that people can be doing collectively. So that's, I think, something that we can be doing. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I'm just going to build on what Christine said, because such great ideas. Um, uh, I'll offer, th again, three thoughts. I mean, I think one way to think about how scholars can be more engaged in this moment is to really name the moment and to speak to the moment. And this may sound kind of maybe simplistic, but I actually feel like many times our, our job in academia is to argue that what we're saying is significant given the 
um, theoretical traditions and the history of this conversation in the field. We're making arguments that this is scholarly significant, of scholarly significance. Um, and what I want to argue is that that's interesting, that's helpful to make that argument. But more importantly, I think more and more of our work needs to be arguing that our work is kind of politically significant. It's, it's significant for the moment that we find ourselves in. Um, how often, in other words, when we look at the criteria for publishing, for presenting at a conference, for tenure, for promotion, which I see is in the comments as well, how often are we saying, are we asking questions of how does this research help us respond to the crises that we find ourselves in or, or so on, right? Or contribute to them for that matter. Um, so I think naming the moment is one way that I think about trying to make our research more engaged. And I think a second is, as Christine is talking about, really inserting our research into the public discourse. So as Christine is pointing out, this it, there's many barriers to uh, doing more public facing scholar or writing in more public facing ways, right? One is we're not trained to do that, to speak to a much larger audience. Um, in fact, we, we even create institutional criteria for establishing yourself as a kind of, you know, accomplished scholar by prioritizing the venues that might be read by a very small number of people, right? We we most value sort of field specific, highly competitive, um, um, you know, academic journals rather than sort of getting our research onto the into the public. And I'm not saying one is more important than the other, I, but I am saying they're both important, and we need to find more ways to support engaging in public scholarship. So I think training is one. I think changing institutional criteria for progress. And I also think shifting professional norms. Like how many times have I been on a panel talking about kind of proudly, hey, a bunch of us in Chicago came together and we tried to speak against these policy reforms that were coming down the pipe. And then there's another scholar in Chicago <laughs> This has actually happened. This actually happened in the middle of all these struggles, in the middle of a panel that's trying to say, how do we advance justice? There's a scholar who was like, I think that's being too biased. I think that takes away the credibility of scholars because you're now you're, you're, seeing, you're positioning yourself as too political. And I think a lot of us were trying to say, no, I think we need to redefine what it means to be a scholar. I think we need to redefine what it means to do research. That research that actually tries to speak to the moment isn't somehow less credible research. Um, I would argue that research that isn't trying to speak to the moment and isn't trying to get other people to grapple with these questions is research that simply lacks um, usefulness uh, in this particular moment. All right, so speaking to the moment, inserting or injecting research into the public discourse. And I think a third thing that I would say is, um, I think scholars, one of the skill sets we also need to develop is our ability to frame and reframe arguments. And let me give a really quick example of what I mean by that. So when I'm giving people feedback on, say, an op-ed, but also, by the way, learning to write op-eds, I think, helped me become a much stronger scholar because it gets you to think about what I'm about to say, which is one of your starting points, I think, is to ask, what is the, what is the message or what is the framing that you're responding to? What is the dominant story out there that everyone seems to be buying into that you're trying to push back on? What is it, for example, that race scholars are all saying that you think might be wrong? What is it that the media seems to be all saying that you think is wrong? What do you think that even liberal lawmakers in education are saying that you think is wrong? What are teacher educators typically saying that you're trying to push back on? I think that's actually the starting point, right? Because if we don't name that dominant kind of frame, whether or not we agree with it, how do you know that you're not stuck in it? How do you know that you're actually offering something of of significance that kind of gets us to question whether that's the right frame we should be in, right? Um, remember when um, the Obama administration proposed the teacher prep regulations, like 20,000 teacher prep programs, and how are we gonna evaluate these programs? You need to track your graduates for three years and see if they raise test scores in their classrooms. And if they don't, that means they're not an effective teacher, but neither is the program that prepared them. Do you remember how a lot of teacher educators responded in that moment? A lot of teacher educators said standardized tests, not a very helpful measure of teacher performance. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna look at um, portfolios. We're gonna look at portfolio assessments of students because that gives us a better picture of how students are learning. What I would argue is portfolio assessments do give us a much better picture than a standardized test, but that response still bought into the same logic that the way you evaluate a teacher is you look at student output and then the teacher performance is how 
you're evaluating the teacher prep programs. It's still looking at a value added and output based way of thinking about assessment. What if we were to massively kind of shake up that narrative and say, no, the way we evaluate teachers is you don't look at individual output. You don't simply look at the performance of students because how students learn depends entirely on whether the system for teaching is working and the teacher is merely one part of that system. Does everyone see that value added modeling actually extracts the teacher from the system? It does the opposite of what we should be trying to measure. What we should actually be measuring is how well that system works and what contribution the teacher makes to that system. That is what I would be arguing we should be trying to do and simply therefore for simply replacing standardized tests with a portfolio assessment doesn't give us, not only doesn't give us the answer we're looking for, it actually buys into the wrong, um, the wrong, uh, the wrong argument. So um, learning about how we frame and reframe, I think, is a central skill, whether we're looking at how we write for the media or how we do our scholarship. Okay, well, I could keep listening to this for hours. This is amazing. I'm like, like a fire hydrant, just all this knowledge coming through. Um, we want to pose just maybe one closing thought from both of you, maybe invite a closing thought from both of you. Um, I know the previous question already touched upon this, but what maybe last words of guidance um, you have for us as we try to navigate this new reality as well as the chilling effect all of this has on academia and education in general, what can we do both individually? And I've seen some comments already on, on the chat. What can we do collectively? And so for this question, um, we'll go back to Dr. Kumashiro and then we'll end with Dr. Slater. Yeah, I, um, I would say my main suggestion would be that we find more ways to do things collectively. Um, which goes so against how we think about our work. Like we often get promoted and tenured because you're you're making the argument that you made a singular contribution. Um, I think that if we really think about how social movements operate, social movements social movements change the world how not simply by changing policy, but by changing, but by bringing groups of people together to change the narrative. That that's one way that I think about the central function of social movements. Um, and therefore, I think the more that we can think about how we do our work collectively and even redefine what it means to be academics, to be much more collective in nature. I think that's a, that's an, a direction that I find very exciting. And I'll pass to Christine. Um, I, when I think about this question, I think about um, a meeting of the National Association for Multicultural Education that I was at their conference a few years ago. We were in a hotel and you know how academics, what academics do at conferences. You know, we, we go present papers in different rooms and stuff. On the floor below us, there was also a group meeting, but they were engaged in political action and they had their, their sessions. Um, uh, there were labels on doors, but they were things like organizing for this afternoon's march, finishing, signing, and mailing off our petition they were collectively actually doing something. And I was like, here we are talking to each other. We need to be down with the group downstairs. And, and so when I think about um, organizing politically, I think about we're already actually members of large networks. APA is huge. AERA is huge. Um, I remember the National Academy of Education. It's not huge, but it's big. What if there was a way of our organizations actually engaging collectively in some political work using research because we have the research as the basis for what we're advocating for. So it's not stepping away from research and doing something else. It's mobilizing the research on behalf of the policies that would best serve the kids who are in the schools. And I think that would uh, that would put us in a somewhat different space. And it may actually put us in a place where we could make more of a difference that we're making right now. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.